Hey guys, Molson here and welcome back to the series. Today I'm going to tell you the story of my first international tournament and how I accidentally got my first international master title norm. I've also chosen one particular game which was most memorable for me, which was the one against John Bartholomew, so I hope you stick around and enjoy the video. So I was still playing a lot of online chess at the time and a lot of events in Australia but not so many overseas ones because it was quite pricey and hard to come by. I did play the World Youth event but no international open thus far so I found one called the World Open in Philadelphia and I thought this was a good first place to start out with because it had a huge rating prize and I felt that I was a little bit underrated because I mostly played online. After some convincing with my dad I finally um, got him to take me there and that's how I went to my first international event. So first thing I noticed in this event was they didn't provide any sets or clocks which was very different from what I was used to playing in Australian events and my opponent in the first round also didn't have any so we ended up borrowing and finally playing our game somewhere in a different room. In the final round of the event I was playing a game which started at 7 p.m and it went on forever. It was one of my longest games I ever played and it went past midnight in a completely equal position where my opponent finally blundered and he wasn't very happy with this of course. After the game I was very happy. I met a few people which I played online with and we played over the board blitz for quite a number of hours. It was already getting quite late past like 1am or more in the morning and I was wondering when the prize ceremony was going to take place and I realized that they didn't have a prize ceremony at this stage and one of the people I was playing with actually told me that I won a prize and I should probably go collect it before um, everyone goes off. So I ended up sharing the rating prize with someone else and I also got my first international master title norm there. At the time I didn't know what it was but this set me on the path to collecting the rest of my norms later on. So I've chosen one particular game which I remember from this event very well and that was the one against John Bartholomew and it was in a Scandinavian defense. So I remember when I was preparing for this particular game I wasn't sure if I should be going into the Scandinavian because this was my opponent's like pet line and I w maybe I should try and avoid it. But eventually I came to the conclusion that I should just go into it anyway and then see what um, becomes of it. So the line I chose in this particular game was the one which I analyzed in the previous one, in the Anand Lotia one, which went something like this, knight e5. I also believe knight e5 is a better move order than playing bishop c4 first. Bishop to f5 and then I opted for this one with bishop c4 e6 and then I played the move pawn to g4 kicking the bishop, bishop g6 and then pawn to h4 trying to harass that bishop on g6 as much as I possibly can. So knight d7 was played, knight takes d7, knight takes d7, h5. So I expected my opponent um, who played the Scandinavian for quite a long time, John would be absolutely familiar with a line like this but after rook h3 I was sort of hoping for bishop g2 which was what happened in the game but um, part of me knew that he's probably going to play bishop d5 which he ended up doing. I played the move bishop to d3. This line by the way is totally fine for black I think. Um, it doesn't give white um, anything at all. Uh, John played the move pawn to c5. I'm not too sure about c5 straight away. Um, at the time a lot of people were playing uh, this way but I think now that it might be better to just play bishop d6, queen c7, castle queen side and go for this um, f4 square instead. So after the move pawn to c5 I played pawn captures. Bishop drops back to c6. This is the whole point of pushing the c-pawn to give the bishop a retreat square. Bishop goes to d2, knight takes on c5, queen goes to e2, so I'm preparing queenside castling here with my pieces, queenside castles, and here I don't want to lose the bishop pair, so I have to move the bishop to c4. So before on the previous move I could let him take because the rook would get into the game on d3, but here there's no need to allow that. The queen drops back to c7 to avoid any 
discoveries castles queenside bishop d6 and here is probably one of the most important moments in this particular game because as white here we can see that black is already preparing to take control over this f4 square and both bishops are on very good diagonals so i need to do something and one thing is you need to try and make use of the pieces um, you have on the board and where they're already placed so I really wanted to bring this rook on h3 into the game somehow because at the moment I can't really justify that whole rook lift if the rook has no useful squares to go to the problem is I really want to line up on the c file somehow but it's not easy to do so and I was looking for a way to um, try and make this happen Eventually, I opted for this move pawn to b4, which at first looks really, really weakening. But once you understand the idea, um, it'll start to look a bit more appealing. So I'm really weakening my king here, but I gain a tempo on the knight. And I'm going to follow up with knight b5. And the idea is to swing this rook and h3 into the game. So after knight d7, I played knight to b5. Here I win the bishop pair, because he has to take it. I take back with the bishop on b5 and I'm already threatening the move rook to c3 here. Maybe the rook can also come to a3. And we can see that I was trying to make use of where my pieces are originally placed. So bishop f4, obviously I can't play rook c3 here because he just captures. So king goes to b2, unpinning. We get a trade of pieces. Knight goes to e5 and now the rook swings across to c3, putting pressure on um, black's c file here so knight c6 i traded the rooks first so i could move the queen after rook takes you always want to put pressure on the piece that's being pinned so in this instance it's the knight on c6 so I, i'm looking at the move queen to e4 here to put pressure on the knight but i think that would be answered by rook to d6 so instead i want to create a weakness so i took first and after pawn takes then i played queen e4 hitting the pawn on c6, hitting the pawn on h7. I also have b5 ideas coming up, so black has to be a little bit careful. I do have to be careful of my b pawn as well, but I think white has some initiative here. So king goes to b7, queen takes h7. Here John played the move queen to e5, centralizing the queen um, is a very good idea in um, many positions. Here I needed to get rid of the queen um, in order to start pushing some of my uh, pawns on the queen side. So I decided to trade the f pawn for the g pawn here. If he takes it, which he did, then what would happen is I would get this past h pawn. If he tries to maintain the pin, then I think eventually my queen would come back. Let's say queen f6, my queen could come to e4 and rejoin the attack. And likewise, queen going to d4 could be met by queen d3, offering a queen trade. So instead, queen takes f4 was played. I play queen takes g7. So here I control this dark square diagonal, which is very important. It makes your king a little bit safer in this regard. Queen takes b4 is never a problem because of rook to b3. And I also have this past h pawn. So we have some trumps to play for a win now. Rook goes to d1. So John is trying to create some counterplay here on the back rank. So we need to be aware of this and uh, keep this in check. But I played the move queen to f8, defending the b4 pawn. And I realized that there are a few checks here, but they don't lead to um, anything. For example, queen check can be answered by king across. And the king can always go to um, a3. And it's pretty much safe here. So rook d7 was played instead. And here I played queen c5. The queen rejoins the attack. Queen h1. I played b5. Here John played the move queen to d5, offering a queen trade into an endgame where I was a pawn up, so I was fairly happy with this. I just took it, pawn takes, and then I played h6. So my endgame knowledge wasn't that great but here i do know a few things when it comes to the end game and it's that when it comes to rook end games i can give you the tip that two connected pass pawns are extremely extremely strong so if you've seen my end game video already you know that 
um, having the past H pawn here is very very beneficial and the fact that black has this weak pawn on f7 which can easily be a target by putting the rook on f3 means that um, black is in a lot of trouble here not to mention that uh, black is also a pawn down so king goes to b6 I continued with the move h7 threatening to promote and after rook d8 I played the move rook to f3 so hitting this pawn on f7 the whole goal I'm going for here is to try and create two connected pass pawns in the rook end game. If I can do this, then um, I know that's going to be a very easy win. So here next move, I'm taking the pawn. There's no way to stop it apart from pushing f5. And white can finish the game off here by continuing with the move pawn to g5. There's no need to capture the pawn. So like I said, two connected pass pawns in the rook end game is easily winning, especially if they're very far advanced past the 6th rank. So this was my first experience in an international tournament and I was very happy with my result of course and it set me on the path to getting my IM title later on because once I start something I always like to finish it in the end. So I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one in the series. Catch you then.